Hi, I'm Chris, and I'm a production engineer here at Meta. As you can see, I'm coming to you from a closet in my garage where I've been working for the past two years. In a moment, I'm going to be joined by Jie, a teammate of mine. She and I work together on a team whose mission is equipping the infrastructure teams around us with what they need to withstand and recover from outages that are low in our tech stack. Today, we're going to share an approach through which we've been bringing rigor and experimentation to a poorly understood and frankly, kind of scary topic, curating the relationships between our systems for good behavior during disasters. To tee this up, I want you to envision the tech stack. In your mind, it might look something kind of like what I'm showing you on the screen here. And since we work in infrastructure, we're going to be talking about the lower levels of this tech stack the stuff that sits pretty close to the hardware. This is software that supports all the other software that we run at Meta. It runs on millions of machines and it generally keeps the lights on. Things like service discovery, container management, and control plane storage. When we zoom in on the infrastructure layers of our stack, what we like to think is that we'll find a clean, neat layer cake where every low level capability gradually builds upon the next and there's an obvious ordering of dependency relationships downward through the stack, but not in the reverse direction. However, if you poke around a little bit in reality, it's not so clear that things are always neatly layerable. There's no canonical reference guide to where each system should fit in the stack. So you wind up with this kind of messy bunch rather than a clear tower of layers. And unfortunately, it gets worse from there. Each of the systems that powers one of these capabilities requires pretty much everything else that you see on the screen. And I'm only showing you the very tip of the iceberg. There are scores of systems under the hood that keep things running in our data centers. All of these systems are constantly getting worked on and over time they grow increasingly intertwined. When I look at the bottom of our tech stack, I'm reminded of something that I learned back when I was in school. Like many production engineers at Meta, I don't come from a traditional computer science background. I actually studied mechanical engineering. And I want to borrow a concept from the discipline of thermodynamics. That is, that infrastructure systems, like all complex systems, demonstrate this idea of entropy. Entropy means that the more work we do on a system, the more disorder and interdependence we naturally introduce to it. Trying to undo that disorder all at once can be an impossible task. So a more realistic approach for us is to give ourselves clear constraints and tools for how we curate the relationships that we want between systems in such a way that optimizes for producing the right ones while curtailing the growth of unnecessary coupling. So you might hear this and think, yeah, yeah, that's nice, high-minded talk. But you and your team and your manager at the end of the day, they want to draw the ideal dependency graph to start making messy things tidy. So let's start trying to arrange some of these building blocks. Pretty quickly, even if we just look at two or three of them, it becomes clear we don't know which lines are safe to draw and which lines we should draw. For instance, our container system needs to store its data somewhere, and that storage system needs to route calls to all the other things that run in the data center. But the container orchestration layer also needs routing in order to talk to that storage mechanism. So which of these pictures is the right one? Unfortunately, the right answer isn't abundantly clear unless we know what constraints we're optimizing for and how to distinguish between different types of relationships. For instance, the relationships exercised during runtime aren't the same as the relationships exercised during startup. And even different startup sequences may expose their own distinct call graphs. So there are many problems that we can choose to solve, and each of those has many possible graphs as solutions. To put this another way, without more context, there's no right graph that we should draw. Unfortunately, without doing the hard work that it takes to figure out the right context or constraints, it can be tempting to leap to a common, although very naive pattern, which is just remove all the dependencies. In this sort of utopia, every bit of infrastructure sits directly on its own hardware and relies on nothing else in the data center. And if you can envision this, you think you've solved the problem, right? We've made the most basic call graph by eliminating all the edges. 
This is also very easy to draw, but unfortunately in practice, it's impossible to do at scale reliably because of how much it takes to run software, including infrastructure software, at the scale of millions of machines. We know that this is a difficult approach to take because we tried the zero dependency approach for a very long time with how we run a critical piece of Meta's infrastructure, the open source consistent storage mechanism called Zookeeper. Jay is now going to review for us how, how our long journey with Zookeeper taught us that the constraint we want to optimize for as we curate the dependency graph around it is the obligation that Zookeeper be recoverable from infrastructure outages. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. Now, let's take a look at the evolving journey of Zookeeper at Meta. We started with the ideal, simple approach. We decided Zookeeper doesn't rely on any other Meta infrastructure. Zookeeper will just run on top of the hardware. It wasn't hard for just one cluster. After all, Zookeeper is designed to be at the bottom of the stack with zero dependencies. However, we didn't stop at one single cluster. Over the years, Zookeeper has grown into a control plane storage system that powers a lot of service at Meta. Around 2014, Zookeeper started to power service discovery and config management at Meta. We had so many clusters. We need service discovery and config management for just those clusters. So we build makeshift service discovery and config management functions so we can stay zero dependency. We still don't depend on any other outside services. In 2019, we were running a huge fleet of Zookeeper instances across more than a dozen regions with thousands of use cases. With more and more clusters, we need more and more support for control, for maintenance, for management. So we build our own version of deployment, fleet management, routing, etc., etc. That is, we build our own infrastructure. We were back to the same problem we saw on the opening slides. A tech stack without clear rules or relationships except it was worse. This infrastructure was maintained by a handful of engineers that were supposed to focus on zookeepers. Unsurprisingly, we had more and more zookeeper outages resulted not from zookeeper itself, but from the, those increasing number of services we built to support it. Apparently, this zero dependency approach wasn't sustainable. At this point, we started to ask, maybe we can run Zookeeper on top of some of the standard infrastructure built by dedicated teams that is well supported, well tested, and is used by all the other teams at Meta. If we don't enforce zero dependency on Zookeeper, what Zookeeper requires is no different from other services. If we can run Zookeeper on the common infrastructure, it would greatly reduce our surface area, improve stability, and let us focus just on Zookeeper. But before we can do that, how can we bring up Zookeeper if Zookeeper depends on services that also depends on Zookeeper itself? So for example, if we want to ditch the full lead management system and want to switch to run Zookeeper in containers that managed by a reliable, and the efficient orchestration system. This would require us to deploy Zookeeper in containers. However, just starting a container invokes a long list of services that depends on Zookeeper. How can we bring up Zookeeper in this case? This is the question we have to answer before we can run Zookeeper on top of other services. As engineers, we all know Given enough time, all systems break. So does Zookeeper. And it could also cause other services it powers or it depends on to fail too. So we have to make sure we can recover 
if something fails and we need to know how to recover. This requires us to understand the dependencies among systems. As we saw at the beginning of this talk, drawing a clean dependency graph is not easy. Assessing the huge landscape of the infrastructure all at once is overwhelming. So, instead of trying to understand the super complicated dependency relationships among all the systems, or trying to cope with the million different ways things can break, we ask the question in a different way. What if all the services at Meta are broken? What do we have to have before we can recover Zookeeper? By drawing a bounding box around Zookeeper, focusing only on the first hub dependencies and the minimum requirement to recover Zookeeper to a minimum healthy state, we make the problem much more manageable. Within the bounding box, we experimented with a small set of binaries, libraries, and remote services that have to function before we can recover Zookeeper from a broken state to a healthy state. With these experiments, we can find the right place for the escape hatches that can break the circular dependencies during bootstrapping. For example, we built a tool that can state, start Zookeeper in containers without talking to the container orchestration services that depend on Zookeeper. So we get a clean dependency graph just for recovery that allows us to safely run Zookeeper on top of other services. The system we built to draw this bounding box is called Belja. The boundary we are drawing is like a moat that isolates our experiments away from the rest of meta infrastructure, except those are explicitly allowed. You can tune the shape of the mode by change what you allowed inside it. You can run whatever recovery procedure inside the mode. Under the hood, we use virtual machines as testing, uh, testing environment. We push our fourth injection system to the extreme to degrade the testing environment so that only those things that are allowed in the mode are reachable or workable. During the process, we've not only found the requirements and the steps to recover Zookeeper, we also codified them. We end up with a test that we can run continuously and verify those requirements and the steps continuously. With Belja, we find the recovery strategy for Zookeeper, and it also has some very nice side effects that Chris will talk about next. Thanks, Jay. As we deployed Belgiar for Zookeeper, we indeed began to realize some pretty neat benefits of this approach. The Zookeeper team began getting immediate feedback when some recovery requirement of theirs broke, whether it was in Zookeeper's code, there was assumptions about somebody else's code, maybe the change to the tooling or the steps in the runbook they used, and they got that feedback before the regression shipped to production. Also, because of the new recovery as code approach, we could now start generating runbook documentation directly from the Belgiar test itself and guarantee that it was always up to date without any need for extra manual documentation effort. And we found ourselves beginning to expose the explicit requirements for Zookeeper's recovery in a format that was readable by humans and also a format that was readable by machines. Building on these benefits, we had a kind of an amazing realization. And that was that this problem was not specific to Zookeeper in the slightest. If we could determine the recovery requirement signatures, so to speak, for other systems, we could begin to understand how our infrastructure fits together through the lens of recovery. We began to onboard other teams to Belgiar just to see where the recovery graphs intersected, overlapped, or created cycles. This, in turn, allowed us to spot some common denominator problems to solve for, for the benefit of many teams with a single solution. For instance, the need for us to be able to turn up select containers without issuing RPCs to our container orchestrator, as Jay mentioned. But also, we needed a way to obtain the binary packages that comprise those containers 
without calling to the package front-end system. For these problems and for some others, our team coordinated or built common solutions that a bunch of infra teams could use off the shelf, which eliminated much of the reinventing of disaster recovery tools that we'd seen up until this point. We also realized that not only could we use Belljar to assert good behavior of the recovery strategies for the services that run on our machines, we could also use it to probe how the libraries that compose the building blocks of those services behave during specific disasters. And similarly, we could analyze the daemons that run alongside our containers on bare metal hosts. We could even use Belljar to prove that the CLI tools that engineers would reach for in an emergency will work as expected under the most constrained of conditions. We began to use Belljar to assert all kinds of good behavior expectations, not just on recovery sequences, about our code when it's exposed to all kinds of widespread categorical outages. So after working with more than 40 infrastructure teams to add rigor to how they approach recovery, we've deduced a lot of pretty interesting patterns. I'm gonna share a few of them. Everything that we see though underscores this theory of entropy that I mentioned earlier. Our systems get amazingly disordered unless we are deliberate about how we control the chaos. And we need good tools like Belljar to help us see and constrain the sprawl that's going to happen between systems. I'm gonna highlight three patterns that we've landed on, but I encourage you to look at our corresponding meta engineering blog post for some details on a few of the others. The first that I'll highlight here is about escape hatches. Sometimes you do need a special recovery mode to decouple systems for the sake of bootstrapping. Some service A needs to be able to start before it can satisfy the recovery requirements of service B. But you get to choose how many escape hatches your infra team builds and maintains, and that number should be very small. One-off special flags for bespoke systems tend to go untested. So instead, pick a single common denominator across many systems wherever possible and ensure that it gets first-class testing and treatment. For us, this meant providing an out-of-band container bootstrapping toolkit, which is one solution that's now used by more than a dozen different systems. The second finding I'll share is that soft dependencies often aren't soft at all. Things like timeouts and retries and failovers are valuable tools for absorbing faults, but you don't really know their cumulative effect until you test them. We found, for instance, in our core configuration library, which is used by thousands of services, that it could gracefully fulfill requests even when an upstream source of truth was unavailable. However, a cascading set of nested and sequential timeouts added up to more than four and a half hours of waiting before some of those requests would come back as responses. This kind of soft dependency manifests more as a crash looping recovery, which is super hard to debug on the fly. And the last thing I'll share here is that the half-life of experiments is exceptionally short. Just because some recovery tool or runbook worked last week does not mean that it works now. This simple strategy to bootstrap Zookeeper, for example, has been the lucky recipient of more than half a dozen recovery breaking changes over the past two years, mostly through innocuous library upgrades or tooling bugs. Without continuously verifying every release candidate before it goes to prod, we would have limited protection from these kinds of regressions. So it feels like we're just starting to explore what we can do with this new approach and tooling. So to wrap things up, I'm gonna share a couple of directions that we're headed from here. The first is we really wanna invest in our ability to do graph analysis. Now that we've codified the recovery needs for a bunch of individual infrastructure systems in isolation, we have the data that we need to programmatically analyze the transitive third and fourth hop relationships so that we can automatically detect cycles or invalid edges in our growing recovery graph. Second, with our privileged view of so many teams recovery strategies, we are learning a lot about common patterns and bottlenecks for handling outages. Where we can provide additional common tools or techniques or knowledge, we can help simplify recovery in a universal way across teams that might otherwise never meet each other. And lastly, our ultimate goal is proving recoverability in production. This means running fully featured services in pre-degraded states over long periods of time in the wild. And it also means demonstrating recoverability on an increasingly broad scale 
through severe outage exercises with multiple production systems. Isolated testing and analysis are just the stepping stones that we need to proving the recoverability where it counts. So with that, I want to say thank you for joining Jay and me in our exploration of how we're more rigorously approaching our infra's recoverability. As you can tell, we've, we've still got a ways to go. So if you're interested in this kind of work, please get in, get in touch. Thanks again.